I come to you today with no makeup on. Oh, the horror. But that's because I need a fresh face in order to try this plethora of cosmetics. Now, where in the world did I get these and what are they? So I actually got these from a really neat Etsy store and I'm not sponsored at all, but I've been buying these from this store for the last decade now. I've been into history for a while and I got them from this store called Little Bits on Etsy. And what she does is she finds actual receipts from the time period for cosmetics and she recreates them to the best of her abilities and she sells them. Now sometimes she does have to substitute some of the ingredients. For example, uh, spermaceti was in a lot of ingredients back then. Now what is that? That is the oil from the head of a sperm whale. You can't buy that anymore. It's actually illegal. Please don't buy it. So instead, the closest substitution that we can get today is Jehovah oil with a little extra beeswax added in. So I'm gonna try some of her early 1800s recreations and I'm gonna review them for you all. Honestly, I mean, I'm not gonna to try to exaggerate it, make it sound better than it really is. And I've only tried uh, maybe two of these products ever in my life, so I'm a little nervous. I don't know how to apply some of these exactly. For example, the mascara. This doesn't look like mascara to me, so that'll be very interesting. I'm going to read out the little business card that came with my order, so you guys get an idea of what this store is about. Again, not sponsored. She doesn't even know I'm making this video. We are dedicated to researching and reproducing historical apocryphy and beauty recipes using only natural, certified, organic, and fully sustainable ingredients. Now is your chance to use the same recipes our ancestors did and see just how beneficial and healthy they are. Okay. <laughs> And something that I thought was really interesting when I was looking at these products was how incredibly minimalist the ingredient lists usually are. So for example, um, this item, which I'm gonna talk about first, only has three ingredients in it, yet this was a bestseller for about 50 years, which just completely blows my mind. It only has three ingredients in it. How do you, I mean, that's just, wow, okay. So I'm going to go in order of how people usually apply their makeup during the day. Usually you put on your foundation, I'm talking about the 21st century here, and then maybe you put on your blush, and then maybe you do your eye makeup. But before all of that, you have to prep your skin. And it was the same back then as it is today. So. They didn't have makeup primer back in the early 1800s. Now we're talking 1790 to 1830. That's the focus of today's video. But they did have this. Now this is called Milk of Roses. This is a recipe from 1811. And the three ingredients are rose water, almond oil, and oil of tartare. All of these things are perfectly safe. And I don't know how in the world little bits managed to get the consistency that she did with almond oil inside of it. I mean, it feels like a gel. You would just assume that the oil would float on top. So I did some research about this oil of tartare and apparently it is an emulsifier. So that's why even though this only has three ingredients in it, the oil is perfectly emulsified inside of this serum. I would describe it as a serum. And you're supposed to shake it up just a little bit before you use it, but for the most part, it does not separate. Now for the smell, it really is strong. I mean, it's like a perfume. As you can kind of guess from the name, it smells like roses. And I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I, I really, really do appreciate a good natural floral scent. And this really has a very strong rose smell. Um, and the smell does not go away. I mean, you apply this and two hours later, it still smells like roses. It's almost like a perfumed serum. So I know a lot of people in today's time don't like fragrance in their skincare products. If that's the case, don't use this. But if it doesn't bother you, try it out. Um, I'm gonna apply a little bit onto my hand here and back in the day, you would have either just dipped your finger in it and rubbed it on, or you would have put it on a handkerchief and rubbed that on your face. I have to say, I really, really do enjoy this. And I've never tried this product before until I received it in the mail yesterday after ordering it. 
and I, I really, really like it. I mean, it's super simple. There's nothing offensive about it. I did some research into oil tartar. It's perfectly safe. They actually use it in baking. So it's food grade, it's edible. And I think I'm gonna use this for a while. Um, so it says on the bottle that this is an excellent wash for sunburns. Freckles are for cooling on the face and neck or any part of the skin to which it is applied. A recipe for Milk of Roses was even included in Martha Lloyd's household book. Now, Martha Lloyd was the best friend of Jane Austen. This book was a compilation of food and medical recipes and it was compiled between 1796 to 1830. The recipe in it for Milk of Roses read as follows. Milk of Roses, one half pint of rose water, one half an ounce of sweet almonds, 12 grains salt of tartar to be mixed well all together. It's interesting to note that this product was so popular in the 19th century that it was also available commercially, which was kind of rare for the time period because usually people made their own cosmetics at home. Um, for example, it was sold by Richard Warren and Richard Rosser of Bond Street in London. We're off to a good start, not bad, early 1800s, not bad. I mean, my skin feels very, very smooth. I applied this this morning and it's smooth. It's extremely perfumed. I have to get kind of used to that. But other than that, my, I mean, it feels really, really good. It doesn't feel greasy either. Now that you have the base that you're gonna put your makeup on, what would they use for foundation 200 years ago? Now this is a little bit Okay, what can I say? The early 1800s, they did not wear heavy makeup. Uh, it was very, very fashionable to wear heavy makeup in the 18th century. However, after the French Revolution, it started to become associated with what was known as the old regime to dress and to wear uh, really gaudy clothes and really heavy makeup because that's something that the old generation did back in the 18th century. Well, now we're in the 19th century, the 1800s. So this new generation, the young folks, the teenagers, the trendsetters, uh, they didn't want to wear what their parents wore. They didn't want to wear the heavy makeup, uh, which could either be made with uh, mineral makeup like zinc paste or it could have been made with a lead based paint so instead of wearing the thick painted on makeup which i actually do have an example of it here again from the same etsy store um, but instead they would wear face powders in this time period it was a lot lighter than face paints now today in the 21st century uh, we will wear foundation, which is liquid foundation usually, or you can wear a powder foundation. So just imagine back then that liquid foundation was not popular anymore and mineral powder foundation was in. Basically, that's what happened. So what they would wear for the powder makeup a lot of different options here. Obviously some were safer than others and the same can be said of today, but the most safe option was rice powder. And rice powder was uh, also available in America because of the rice plantations down south in the Carolinas. Now rice from America was usually called Carolina rice. And we used to make so much of it that it was actually exported um, to England because rice used to be a major cash crop in America along with cotton and tobacco. So I have some rice powder here and there's a lot of different companies that sell rice powder, but I wanna try uh, this store's brand out. Now it's just white in appearance. It has absolutely no smell really. I feel like I'm gonna sneeze if I keep smelling this but it has no smell and I'm gonna see if it goes on transparent or not or if I'm gonna look a little goofy. You could have applied it with a brush or you could have applied it with a little powder poof here um, or you could have put it on with a sponge too. I've seen references to women applying it very very heavily at first with a powder poof and then afterwards going in with a brush and kind of clean enough that excess. And I, I think women have been doing that even through the 1960s. It's just a common technique. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply this onto my face and see if I look any drastically different. Okay, so I, in order to make this kind of neat here, I'm just gently tapping into it and I'm tapping off the excess into the lid. 
And I'm going to apply this mainly on my nose. <laughs> okay, that's that went on a little heavy. <laughs> Jeez. Let me rub that out. <sighs> You could have applied this all over your face. Um, I have dry skin, so I think I'm only, I'm mostly going to apply it on what's called the T-zone, which is above your eyebrows and down your nose, down to your chin. But I guess for the sake of the video, I'll also apply a little bit all over too. It's perfectly harmless. It, it is just dried, powdered up rice. And something as simple as this, it was popular for over a hundred years, even Victorian women. Now keep in mind, this is not the Victorian period. The early 1800s is actually in America, the federal era and over in England is the Regency period. And then we have the Victorian period with the birth of Queen Victoria over in England. But it was popular from this time until all the way through the Victorian period. So something this simple doesn't really go out of fashion. And I know women still to this day apply rice powder. It's of course very popular over in Asia where rice is a major, major crop. I didn't think it was possible, but I am actually a little bit paler. That's, I didn't think that was possible. So it did leave a little bit of color on my face. Um, nothing too serious though. And I do think that if I had only really applied it to my T-zone, it probably wouldn't have made too much of a difference. Now, as far as what my face feels like, um, I'll admit it's not as smooth and as refined as modern day powders are. However, if I brush it off just a little bit like this, it definitely does make my skin much smoother and softer. I actually really like it. Even though I have dry skin, I normally don't powder my face. They do say that there's like this old trick where if there's certain parts of your face that you don't want to highlight, that you actually apply powder to that area. Like for example, if you're really self-conscious about your nose, you can powder your nose and it'll make it more dull compared to the rest of your face so it doesn't stand out so much. Uh, maybe I'll start doing that. Rice powder, I like it. So now we're going to move on to the next part of our makeup routine, which is blush, also known as rouge. This is my favorite part because I'm a little bit rouge obsessed. I don't normally wear a lot of makeup every day. I never ever wear eye makeup. I wear usually just some rouge and a little bit of eyebrow powder and that is all the makeup I've been wearing for like the past 10 years. That's just my personal preference. And I have only tried one of these before and this one I am absolutely obsessed with and I actually use it in my everyday life now. It comes in a little glass pot and we'll talk about that one later. Um, save the best for last, right? So which one should I try on first? I've never tried any of these before. I'm just gonna grab one. Okay, we have Liquid Bloom of Roses. So out of every rouge that I'm using today, this was the most long lasting, the most popular one. Now the French perfume house Guerlain, or Guerlain, was the first company that was commercially selling Liquid Bloom of Roses. Before then you had to make it yourself at home. It was made starting from the 18th century and it was popular all the way through the 1950s. Every company made it slightly differently and there's a dozen different recipes or receipts as they used to be called for liquid bloom of roses. I have a tissue underneath this before I open it just because the rug that I'm standing on right now is 200 years old. So I definitely don't want to accidentally drip some on that. So I'm going to try out the liquid bloom of roses on my hand. Okay, it's a lot more pink than I thought it was going to be. Um, it's very liquidy. It's very thin. It, I mean, it's very watery. Now in the bottle, all of these rouges look exactly the same. They all look red. Um, there really is one shade that you can go off of in this time period and that's red. I will say this is not very pigmented uh, compared to what I'm used to with modern cosmetics. So can you guys even see that? Let me go in with a second layer. Again, it's very watery. A little more on the pink side than red, surprisingly. 
Okay, so that is Liquid Bloom of Roses. Now, I will say in this time period, having a subtle makeup look was trendy. So you didn't want to have very obvious looking rouge on. So maybe that's why this is so subtle. Now, me in person, I do see it a little bit. I just don't know if the camera is going to pick it up so well. It honestly kind of looks like a bruise on my hand, which in a way is a compliment because that means it looks very natural. Smell-wise, very, very subtle uh, wood kind of smell, almost like saddle wood. It actually smells really, really pleasant. I was worried that uh, some of these rouges were gonna have kind of a vinegary smell, because I know back then they often use vinegar as a base, um, or alcohol, just straight up brandy, they would use as a base in their liquid cosmetics. Well, you're gonna smell like you just came home from the bar, or you're gonna smell like vinegar, like a dill pickle. But this really doesn't have a weird offensive smell. It actually smells uh, like perfume, you know, like I said, like saddlewood. It smells very, very good. Okay, so Liquid Bloom of Roses, that is our very first rouge. Don't have anything else to compare it to at the moment, except for my Holy Grail rouge that we're gonna try later. I'm gonna remove the rouge that I just applied with um, a cotton round with some rose water on it so that I can try the next one and let you guys see the true color of it. Uh, so it's definitely pink, Bloom of Roses. Okay, so on to the next one now. I am going to try Turkish Rouge. Now, I do know that after Napoleon um, came back from the Middle East, that everything Middle Eastern was very, very much in vogue. And maybe that's why Turkish Rouge kind of had a moment in the early 1800s. But Turkish Rouge apparently has been around since the 1740s. It's described as a beautiful and inoffensive rouge, which means it's beautiful, but it's not so vibrant that you look like you're wearing makeup. It's made with Brazil wood, which is actually from an endangered tree. The Brazil trees are endangered. So the Etsy store Little Bits uses recycled Brazil wood shavings from violin makers. Now, Brazil wood is very popular when making violins. So we're gonna try this one out, see how it compares to the Liquid Bloom of Roses that we just tried. This receipt is from 1810. Okay, that is a lot more pigmented than the uh, Liquid Bloom of Roses. And it's also a lot more red. That is extremely red. Wow, okay. Uh, that's That definitely did its job, I would say. It is, again, very liquidy. It feels like it's a water or alcohol-based formula. There's really no thickness to it at all, but I'm just kind of patting it into my skin right now, and it's already 90% absorbed. It doesn't feel like it's gonna move around too much, so I feel like with these, you have to apply them very, very quickly before they set. So it is red with a little touch of pink to it. Definitely way more pigmented than the Liquid Bloom of Roses. And this one again was popular from 1740 to 1810. It became especially popular after Napoleon returned back from the Middle East. But does it pass the smell test, which quite frankly is very important. Okay, I'm surprised. Um... Again, it does not have an inoffensive smell, and I, I don't know why I just kind of went into this experiment thinking that all of these were going to smell like something from a barn. Um, but I mean, I guess I can understand why genteel ladies back then wouldn't have wanted to smell so foul. But yeah, it doesn't smell bad at all. Um, it almost has no smell at all, really. Maybe just the slightest little hint of, a, again, a wood smell, and that's probably from that Brazil wood but you really have to focus to detect anything in there. It's super, super subtle. I would say it's fragrance-free, personally. So the next one I'm gonna try is a liquid rouge that exactly imitates nature. I got curious, so I located a copy of Toilet de Flora, published in 1772, and I'm going to read to you the exact receipt that this rouge is made from. A liquid rouge that exactly imitates nature. 
Take a pint of good brandy and infuse therein half an ounce of gum benjamin, an ounce of red sanders, and half an ounce of brazil wood, both in coarse powder. With half an ounce of roch alum, cork the bottle tight, shake it well every day, and at the expiration of 12 days, the liquor will be fit for use. Lightly touch the cheeks with this tincture and it will scarcely be possible to perceive that rouge has been laid on. It will so nearly resemble the natural bloom. Yeah, I'm gonna try to remove this. Uh, that came right off, so that's nice. <laughs> I was a little worried that some of these things would stain really bad, but they're not actually. Okay, I'm gonna dry that off. So I'm going to apply a rouge that exactly imitates nature. Now this one is from 1772, this exact receipt here. However, this liquid rouge was popular into the early 1800s as well. And this particular one comes from the book Toilet de Flora. Oh my gosh, that, that is actually a completely different color than the previous two. Okay, okay, I'm, I am, I am captivated right now. I mean, yeah, that kind of looks like blood. Wow, that is very pigmented. Wow, okay, this one is the most pigmented out of all of them. I thought Turkish Rouge might be the most pigmented, but this one, even though, again, it is completely watery, there's really no give to it. There's no thickness going on in there. It just feels like water. But that is a beautiful, very pigmented rouge. You can see how dark it is on my finger. That'll show up on just about everyone's skin tone, I think. Even though the receipt book, Toilet de Flora, which was a cosmetic and personal hygiene book, uh, says that this rouge is very inoffensive and can barely be perceived, I beg to differ. I mean, this is extremely visible. Now, I do have very fair skin, so it's gonna pop on me for sure, but wow. Uh, off camera, I showed this to Ron, and he said it looked like I stuck my hand in boiling water because my hand is so red right now. Now I'm gonna give it the sniff test. Okay, okay. Ooh. <clears throat> Okay, um, on the hand, it does not have a smell. So that's good. I guess once you rub it on your skin and you rub it a very thin layer, it does not have the smell that I'm smelling right now directly from this container here. Because if you smell it directly, it smells like wine. It's alcohol mixed with some strange funky woods but emphasis on wine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's not the best smelling, but at the same time, again, it's not as bad as I really would have thought a lot of these would smell like because they don't have any added perfume and they're all made from completely natural ingredients. And a lot of them have alcohol and wood extracts and things like that. So it's, this is the most pigmented one. It's also the foulest smelling one, but it's really not that bad. Uh, at least not compared to what I thought it was going to smell like. Uh, pleasantly surprised with liquid rouge that exactly imitates nature. So all these rouges, the purpose of them is to make it look as if you are naturally blushing. You naturally have that blood coming to the surface of your cheek. Oh, Mr. Darcy. Oh, I'm so flustered. Yeah, that. Well, if I see Mr. Darcy and this is what happens to me, I would consider myself allergic to Mr. Darcy. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to wipe this off. Okay, now, uh, this is coming off. I really thought that these were going to stain my hands really, really bad, con especially considering how terribly pigmented this is, but it's not. In fact, it's gone. <laughs> not bad, not bad. So next I'm gonna move on to my Holy Grail Rouge, which is actually a cream-based rouge, unlike the three I just tried, which are liquid. So let's talk about that. This receipt is from 1811, and this is called Red Pompatum. Now what in the world is a pompatum? That extremely hard word to say. It's basically when you have a rouge or a hair, 
cream or something that has the consistency of a salve. So it's a little bit oily to the touch, but it's not liquidy at the same time. It glides on really well. It's smooth. It's slick like a salve. That is a pompatome. So here we are. This is the 1811. This is my holy grail rouge that I've been using forever. That's what it looks like. It feels buttery soft when you rub your fingers into this. Little bits, you did a very good job on this. So I'm going to apply it onto my hand. It feels like a very moisturizing lip balm, basically. If, if I can describe it in a way that will make sense to the common uh, everyday person, it feels like a lip balm. It's that same really moisturizing, slightly greasy, but not greasy feel. So as you can see, it definitely does have a pigment. It's very red, bright red, the same kind of red that you see in the pot here. It smells like roses. That's because it does have rose essential oil in it. So out of all the rouges I've tried, this is the only perfumed rouge. This one I actually feel confident to put on my face. Now I use this and all these rouges are actually intended to be used on your lips as well as your cheeks. So I just apply it like it's basically a tinted lip balm. And that is the historically correct way of doing it. They would have put it on their cheeks as well as their lips. You could have used a brush or you could have used your fingers if you're a peasant like me. So I'm gonna need to look in the mirror for a second. Now I just use my fingers to tap it out. Usually I kind of do like that upside down triangle technique where you form it around here. You could have also applied this underneath your rice powder, but I prefer the cheeks to be a bit more glowy and dewy, so I'm applying it over the rice powder. And if you don't want to apply it with your fingers, but you still want to be historically accurate, you could use a sponge. This is a natural sea sponge. I have very sensitive skin, so I feel like it's a little scratchy um, on me. I would just rather use my fingers, but to each their own. It smells like roses, that's for sure. If you wear this and the milk of roses, you are going to stink of a flower garden. In fact, uh, Ron, who's in the next room right now, told me that I absolutely reek of roses and I haven't even put perfume on. I literally just used Milk of Roses. And right now I've added to his misery by using this rose scented pompatum, which is, again, that's basically like a more gooey salve pomade. So I've already applied it. It took me, what, 30 seconds maybe? It's on my lips, it's on my cheeks. I absolutely love this stuff. So, how do I look? Mm. And how do I smell? Hmm. Actually, quite pleasant. And I don't like roses, but this oh. ain't bad. And you look like a spring blossoming flower. You look a very spring blossoming flower? You look very beautiful. That's what every lady likes to be called. Well, thank you. Okay, dismiss. Cha-cha. It's official. I'm a spring blossoming flower. I appreciate it greatly. <laughs> Now we have one thing left to try. I'm the most nervous about this one item because it goes on my eyes. And I am not an eye makeup person. The last time I applied eye makeup, I was in high school. This is powdered coal. Now the way they would use this back then, realistically in the United States, is they most likely were not using it as eyeliner, especially out here in Missouri and Illinois. I highly tout it because it was just not fashionable to have eyeliner in this time period. Now, maybe in London and Paris, they were wearing eyeliner, but out here, definitely no, not in the United States. So instead, they would have worn this as mascara. This is a black powder. It's actually activated charcoal. That's the particular ingredient that Little Bits uses in their coal. And I'm going to just dump this into some water because that's the easiest way, the most foolproof way of doing it. You can also take your bone applicator. This is made out of cow bone, by the way, and just dip it in water and just put it on the end uh, like so, and you see it picked up some of the products. 
However, I just don't like doing it like that. I've tried it before off camera five minutes ago for the very first time in my life. And I found that it just comes across as very clumpy that way. I'm, I'm, I just don't know what I'm doing. So I'm just going to apply a little bit of this activated charcoal into this bowl and try to do it that way. And then I'm going to wear this as mascara because that is realistically how they would have worn this here in the United States, most likely. I am pressing the bone applicator into this coal, which I've moistened with some water. And I'm just gonna go in. So I'm gonna apply this as mascara and just act like this is a mascara wand right here, made out of cow bone, perfectly normal. Okay, so um, I'm gonna close my eyes and just kind of like brush it as if I am applying a regular mascara wand that is not made out of cow bone. And I doubt that this is smudge proof. Highly, highly doubt it. Oh, it actually did do a little... Oh, wait. Oh, I got a little smudge here. Okay, let me move on to the next side. But I do see just a little difference. It's very, very subtle. Doubt you're going to capture it on camera. It's kind of one of those things you just have to see in person. But my lashes do look darker. Now my hair color, if you haven't noticed already, is a dark brown. So my eyelashes are already a dark brown. Hmm. I pulled it off. That is extremely subtle, which is what they wanted back then. If you could tell that you were wearing makeup in the early 1800s, you were not doing it correctly. It's a careful art to apply makeup and make it look like you're not actually wearing makeup. So I think I did it. Now, will this seriously pass the smudge test? I have very, very liquidy, watery eyes, um, to put it kindly. I do tend to tear up a lot. I just, I don't know why my eyes are like that. I have very wet eyes. So let's see if I do this, if I kind of rub it with my finger. Am I going to get any of it on my finger? Well, I'll be. Um, a little bit of smudging going on, but really not as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, I do have a little bit of smudging going on underneath here. Now, I did some research about this product, and apparently they never ever applied this to their lower lashes. It was only to the top lashes, and that was probably in order to prevent excessive smudging. Very smart of them. But... I haven't worn mascara in forever, and I actually quite like this product. Um, it's not irritating my eyes at all either, and I have very sensitive teary eyes, but so far, I'm not in agonizing pain. So, in fact, I don't feel it at all. I, I think I quite like this stuff, surprisingly. And I do think that a plus of this applicator is it would be very hygienic. It would be very easy to disinfect and clean. Um, especially compared to the brushes, you know, you can really, really get in here and clean it better than a brush. So maybe there's actually something to this. I can't believe I forgot this last part. It involves playing with fire. What was I thinking? Playing with fire and makeup? Of course those two things go hand in hand. So I have to still paint on my eyebrows. <laughs> How did I forget about that? In my hand here, I have a cup of something that you might have in your kitchen right now. These are cloves, the same cloves that go into pumpkin pie and spice cake and what have you. Oh, that smells really, really good. So cloves, a candle, eyebrows. I don't see the connection there, but apparently there was. So what you do is you take a clove and you burn it over a flame. When you burn the clove, Oh, okay, got nervous there for a second. And let it cool down for crying out loud. It forms a pencil. It comes across on your skin as if it's a black graphite pencil. You apply and hold this just as you would a regular eyebrow pencil.
Now obviously, like every other makeup here, the difference has to be very, very subtle. Do you notice a difference? <laughs> that took five seconds. Okay, I'm gonna do the other one. I have to look in the mirror or else I'm gonna give myself a third eyebrow. <laughs> it works. I mean, you probably have this in your kitchen right now. Just grab yourself a lighter or a candle and try it out. Mm, smells like pumpkin pie over here. That's probably because of my eyebrows. Hmm. What is that? These are cloves, which go in pumpkin pie, actually. Oh, it smells so good. It really does. <laughs> now, Ron. Now what? I don't want to be so blunt, but I do notice that your eyebrows lately have been looking a bit grayer than I remember. Well, it's probably all this stress building that new homestead. Yeah, because I want the house to look like this. This is a very grand house. It is a very <laughs> grand house. So what are you proposing? May I use this on your eyebrows? On my what? On your eyebrows. It's to darken your eyebrows. It's just clothes. Uh, sure. <laughs> We can okay. give it a go, I, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to take a clove and I'm going to singe it in okay. a fire and then it forms a pencil. Don't worry, you're not going to catch on fire. Calm down. I hope not. Okay, obviously I'll let it cool down. Okay, yeah, you got to blow that thing out first. <laughs> okay, I think we're good. It cools I, down I fast. sure hope so. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. Okay, that feels warm and weird. Oh, you look more beautiful with every single stroke. Nah, if you say so. Okay, Ron. Look at, in the mirror and see your new beautiful self. Oh, wow. I look 20 again. Just because of the eyebrows? Yes. I like that. Show the camera. We need to go I to town. Only, I can only move one. Oh, that's because I, I burnt off your nerve endings and paralyzed <laughs> your other eyebrow. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. All right, well, I'm going to go show off my eyebrows to town because I feel like a young, a young lad now. Let's Shall do we? that. Let's show off our eyebrows. Well, real quickly before we run off to town to show off our new brows, I want to give a big thank you to the Premier Bernard home here in Ellis Grove, Illinois. The uh, groundskeeper, Michelle Baker, a good friend of ours, has opened up the home for us to film here, and we're very grateful for it. Uh, it's not often we get into a fine house such as this that's completely furnished. Now, they are operable for tours from May through October, uh, so be sure to check them out. The house is from 1802, and thank you guys for watching.